So I know we already heard a whole lot about the walk to Emmaus, but I did want to add one more thing. Uh, first, thanks to Tom for driving down. He drove all the way down from Prescott Valley. Not this morning, but last night. <laughs> um, he's been here all morning long talking to us about the walk to Emmaus. So thank you very much for coming. And then, yeah, um, and there is actually a, a sense of, um, I guess when I start, first started looking at the walk to Emmaus, I had a lot of support around me because I, I've not been on the walk to Emmaus, but I went on Chrysalis as a teenager. And so when I first started considering it, I mean, obviously, like, my parents knew about it, and a bunch of people in my church knew about it, and so there was a whole lot of support. You may be thinking, like, I might be interested in going on a, like, spiritual retreat weekend, but how do I even begin that? Um, this is a really cool way to do it. They surround you with all kinds of support. So we have a person here in our church who's the connection point, and that's Becky Case. Raise your hand. Hi, Becky. Uh, you can go and talk to her. You can talk to Tom this week. And you can also talk to Becky, and you can talk to her any week about this. I must say that um, going to Chrysalis as a teenager is one of the most transformative experiences um, for me and actually you know, called me further into leadership in the church. I know it's a scary word, but leadership can mean so many different things. When you go on something like the Walk to Emmaus, you are encouraged in your own spiritual gifts and the ways in which God is uniquely calling you. And so I do encourage you to look into it if you're at all interested. So enough about that. Enough about that. So continuing our series on sticky faith, um, this week is kind of unique um, because we're focusing in on justice. You know, we, we started off the series kind of like dark and, and quiet. We were talking about the terrible, terrible state of the church in which young people are finding it harder and harder to connect with church and church life and so they just don't come anymore and so the the church overall is aging and everybody asks the question like what's going to happen to the church i know hard to believe in this service right because there's almost yeah. more kids than, than adults um some weeks that is true actually when you do the numbers um, but overall that's the reality and then we talked about the importance of identity and how we find our identity in christ first and then how the conversations and relationships that we make in the church um, inform us and change us. But this week we're talking about justice and the idea that as we live our lives, we're supposed to be living out, you know, service and justice and help to others as just like a daily thing, as it's just a normal way of living. That service and justice are indeed a way of life. So um, if, if service and justice are a way of life, then it should just kind of define and permeate everything about us, right? Okay, so in the, in the book, Sticky Faith, which you can get your copy in the back, but in the book they talk about how important it is to embody this um, as like a church family, but also in our homes as a family. And so there's this exercise where the author has her kids answer the question, or actually just finish the sentence. My family is dot, dot, dot. Can you imagine posing that question to your family? Yeah? What would be like your, your first response? My family is, how would you fill in the, the end of that sentence? Crazy, I know. I said chaotic about mine, so yes. Okay, first answer. But then if you were to look a little bit deeper, what are the kinds of things that you would want your family to be defined by? My family is close. Oh, that's a good one. My family is athletic, all right. My family is loving. loving. Oh, at the same time. Wow. Wow. Across the room. That was crazy. <laughs> these, are, these are things that you would answer um, with my family is. And she says, you know what? That's exactly it. I want my family to be considered loving. Like, that's part of our identity. And as she kind of boiled down all these different answers to the end of the sentence, she said, you know what? When it comes down to it, I really want our family to be in love with God and in love with serving others in the name of Christ, which totally goes along with our church mission statement, right? So it's kind of the same in the church, too. We love God, we love others, and we want to change the world. That, that idea of justice, of, of bringing about change through our love of God is what we love about every single day. So, in fact, this idea of, like, setting forth our identity and the things that we value has been like marketed to the masses, right? So you've probably seen something like this at the store where it says like, in this house, 
we do such and such, right? Maybe you have one at home. This came off my wall. Anybody else got one? No? You don't have a festival? Okay, good. You guys have one too? Well, they all kind of say the same thing. So it'll say like, in this house, we give second chances. Um, we have family dinners. We laugh. We love one another. We do thank yous. And then I love this one. We use our words. So maybe it's like a family discipline plan too, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you get the gist of it, right? That all of these things are what we hold near and dear. Now, we move a lot because, you know, Methodist pastor, we're itinerant, and so uh, every time we move, I have to figure out another place in the house to put this, right? And I always have a little bit of trouble with it. I mean, I like it, and I always find a place to put it up, but I always have a little bit of trouble with it because I feel like... Um, like it's not quite our own. Does that make sense? Like someone else made this and someone else came up with it. I wish I wish I could make my own. You know, of like things that we've actually said to each other. Okay, well maybe not things we've actually said to each other. <laughs> um, the good things that we've actually said to each other. And uh, phrases that come up all the time. And I have a question for you that I'm gonna bring up later in the sermon if I remember. Um, I want you to answer it if we were to make one of these for our church. And it said, in our church, we dot, dot, dot. How would you fill that in? Or how would you fill that in about a church that you really want to go to? If you haven't joined the church and you not, haven't been going here long, how would you <coughs> answer that? What kind of church do you want to be a part of? Okay, so that's coming later. Now you're really nervous. Okay. <laughs> the big idea of this series is exactly that. So how do we make justice our own, and uh, how do we embody it in a, on a daily basis? How can we plant a vision for serving others in the name of Christ so deeply in ourselves and in our kids that we just can't help but offer hope and help to someone in need? So I think to begin with, we're going to talk about the difference between service and justice. We're going to separate the two words a little bit. I really like the definition that the book gives, so I'm going to read that to you. The difference between service and justice. Service is giving someone who is thirsty a glass of cold water. It's a noble act. Okay. It's like giving someone who is thirsty a cold glass of water. And it's a noble act, and let's be honest, sometimes that's all we have the time for or the ability to do. But justice goes deeper. Justice asks why the person couldn't get their own glass of water. And it helps them figure out how to get their glass of water and works with them so that they can help others get their own water too. Does that help clarify the difference between service and justice? Well, we're moving into uh, an area of justice instead of just service all the time. And I feel like this idea of justice as a way of life um, will stick better, will be more meaningful, will last longer if we think of it in terms of things that really touch our lives, right? So we get involved in justice issues that we care about. You're not going to get involved in something that never touches your life. You just won't be passionate about it. Honestly, this is the reason that we sign up for like half marathons and big long bike races or like the three-day breast cancer walk because there's someone in our life or in some way that issue has touched us, right? And so we feel compelled to make a difference. So we want to look for ways in which um, justice intersects our daily life. So, example. Um, last weekend, a group from the church went to Feed My Starving Children. We showed pictures last week, but if you weren't here and you've never done Feed My Starving Children, I'll explain to you the gist of it. So you go down, you drive to Mesa, there's a big warehouse. They already have everything set up. So you walk in, they tell you what to do. You pack with dry food, like spoonfuls or cupfuls, into bags, meals that then will be sent overseas all over the world to children and their families who don't have access to food. Okay, so that's a, the gist of it. Now, if you were to take that service project, there are some ways in which you can build on a service experience so that it then becomes a platform for making changes and working towards justice in the world and the life that you live. So the, the book gives all of this. If you have a book at home, you want to look at it. But it says, before you go, begin by framing the experience. Okay, so I finally got to take Margaret to the Feed My Starving Children. I was so excited because I've been volunteering to Feed My Starving Children for years. 
But this was the first time that anybody in my family had been able to go, right? Margaret's finally old enough, she's five, she can finally go. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. So before we go, I'm trying to frame the experience. Okay, so this is what we're going to do, and this is why we're going to do it, and this is where the work that you've done is going to go. So you frame the experience, right? And then it says you help to process it even while you're doing it. So sometimes this is more effective if your service project is more long-term or like it's a mission trip for a whole week. If you've been on a mission trip, they process it as you go along. So you do your service work, and then that night everybody says, what was your high? What, what, what happened today? And you, you kind of process it as you go through it. So I'm asking Margaret, hey, how's it going? Is this exciting? Are you having fun? Can you picture the kids that we're helping? You know, all these kinds of questions. And then after the experience is over, there's two ways to help process it in the debriefing stage. The first one, I am so proud to say, we nailed it, okay? We nailed it, that's right. <laughs> so after we got done with Feed My Starving Children, we went to lunch, okay? And we sat down and we we're doing our burgers and stuff, and, and so it was actually Kara and I, and we're sitting there with our girls, and we're asking them questions like, hey, so what did you think? And, and how many kids do you think we helped? Can you even imagine like that many kids getting that many meals? And you know, the conversation lasted about 45 seconds because that's our attention span. So <laughs> we kept trying to push it, and, you know. But that was the first part of the debriefing, right? Then there's another, um, there's another way to process that experience. And this is where it informs our everyday life and it becomes justice. So I started thinking about it, and I, I remember when I was in high school, um, in the lunchroom, they had the lunchroom set up where there were two lunch lines. And the, there was one lunch line, you know, well, you can bring your lunch, obviously, so those kids would go sit down. And the other lunch line was for the kids who their parents had given them money, like they had cash in hand, or their parents had loaded up the ticket. Uh, do you guys still have a ticket? Do you guys how they work it soon? Okay. All right, so you get a ticket, and your parents can put money on it, and then you buy your lunch, right? But there was another line for the kids who also had a ticket, but these tickets were for the reduced lunches. Yeah, so their tickets, I guess, were like loaded in a different system and maybe needed a different card reader. I don't know, but there was a whole separate line for the reduced lunch line. And you know, that line, they only got like the whatever was that day. They didn't even get a choice. The kids who had money or their parents had put money on their ticket, they could have anything on the menu. Crazy, huh? Yep. Hadn't even thought about that when I was in high school. But it occurred to me, like after we did Feed My Starving Children, that like my kids are gonna have these kinds of experiences. And she might come home and she might say something about that, but now I can talk to her about the fact that there are hungry kids or there are kids in need in her school that she knows because we're informed by the service that we've already done. We can talk about the issue at an even deeper and bigger level. And perhaps this might be something that she's been called to take action on. Like I think about, if I had realized that in high school, like maybe I could have done something. <coughs> like at least we could have worked on making one line or not having them so segregated, right? Perhaps our children or perhaps we can be informed by the issues that we encounter in our lives and then take action based upon God's love for all of us. So I like the way that the book talked about how God loves all of us and desires for everyone to reach you know, who they've been created by God to be. It talks about it as shalom. Have you heard the word shalom before? Yeah, shalom means peace. It's a Hebrew word that means peace. And usually I've just translated it exactly that way, but I really like her translation of it. She says, the state of shalom is the state of flourishing in all dimensions of one's existence. So in relationship to God and in relation to fellow human beings, in relation to nature, and in relation to ourselves. Evidently, justice has something to do with the fact that God's love for each and every one of God's human creatures takes the form of God desiring shalom of each and every one of us. God wants each and every one of us to flourish, to see fulfillment. But it doesn't always work out that way, does it? It doesn't even start out that way. 
So I will always remember an, an exercise that I did with a group I was a part of in high school. So I was also a part of this group called Youth Council. And uh, you know, I look back on it, it's another one of those things where I'm like, and that was really revolutionary and I didn't even realize it at the time. Youth Council was, um, it was for the whole county. So there were kids coming from different school districts and I'm pretty sure they stacked the group so that we were all like from different backgrounds, like economically, <coughs> racially, uh, gender, and all kinds of stuff. But they put us in this group with the purpose of really like learning about and dealing with some of the tougher social issues um, that we're facing our community. So they would have us learn about stuff and then they would send us into the schools to do some presentation on it. So to give you an idea of the stuff we talked about, we, um, we did presentations on drunk driving, on underage drinking, and going together. Um, and then we did a whole series of presentations on STDs and safe sex. Can you just imagine that for a second? I don't even, I don't know exactly how I had the courage to do this, but like as a teenager, they sent us in to talk to other teenagers about safe sex. Does that sound a little crazy? Yeah, okay, it, it actually was kind of cool. <laughs> So we as a youth council had gone through all these different issues together and really like it had opened us up to each other in a way that you don't really open up with your classmates or folks that you just kind of know through school. We've been through a lot of stuff together. So then by the time we got to this exercise, we knew each other really well. The leader of the youth council took us out one afternoon and brought us to a park like with a big open field. And she had us all line up across the field, shoulder to shoulder. And then she just started reading these statements and we just had to do what the statements said. So she read, take two steps forward if one or both of your parents attended college. So I took two steps forward. She said, take three steps backward if uh, you had a parent who died or was incarcerated or has been addicted to something. And some of my friends took three steps back. Take one step forward if you would consider yourself white. Take one step forward if you would consider yourself male. Take one step forward if you consider yourself heterosexual. Take two steps back if you've ever been the target of a racial slur. And we got, you get the idea, but we got to the end of the exercise and I was way to the front. Like there was only one guy in front of me. And I looked back at all of my friends and I just looked around and I realized it, it's never even. Like we don't even start out on the same even playing field. It's always off kilter. God's call is that we live in a broken world but that when we're called to justice, we're called to make it right with God's way. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a destination with this Isaiah passage, and I'm gonna speed up because I know we're getting close to the end of the hour. I wanna lose your attention span. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about Isaiah for a second. So Isaiah is, um, well, first of all, the whole book is focused on salvation. All right, so I always joke that the book of Isaiah really believes that nothing created by human hands could possibly be good because it's all about God and it's all about God's salvific work, okay? All right, so the first part of Isaiah um, is written during the first exile, and it's written by the prophet who lives in Jerusalem. So if you look at a map, you can kind of get a picture of like what he's thinking and the pressures that are surrounding him. So this is like an older map, but I'm going to show you the division between the northern kingdom, kingdom and the southern kingdom, which is like just above Jerusalem, so the, like above the top of the Dead Sea there. Okay, so above that is the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and below that is the southern kingdom, Judah. And the two kingdoms split after King Solomon's death. Okay, the country was really rich during Solomon's reign. Remember, Solomon was the one who got to rebuild the temple. So he spent a whole lot of money, which actually meant that they had to give up some of their lands to make up for what, everything he spent. But then when he died, nobody trusted his son, and so the kingdom split. All right, And they lived for like 200 years as a split kingdom. And then the Assyrians, who actually bordered them on the north and the east side over Israel, 
they decided to expand their empire and they took over. But they stopped just short of Jerusalem. So this is when Isaiah is writing, and he has watched Israel be taken over. And so he writes about, oh goodness, Israel is so shamed. They must have done something huge and great against God, because look, they've been taken over by Assyria. And the sad part about that exile is that when, when the northern kingdom is exiled, they get sent like all over. They don't get sent all together away to one place. Some of them get sent over here and over here and over here, and they're scattered so that they can't really be like themselves anymore. They don't practice the rituals. They're not telling, they're not speaking the words of the Torah. And they're actually called the lost tribes of Israel because they were so scattered they lost their identity. And then the second part of Isaiah is written during the Babylonian exile. And I find this interesting because then, you know, he, the prophet was so worried about um, Assyria taking over. But Assyria didn't take over. Bab Babylon came over and took over Assyria and then all of it together. And all of a sudden they find themselves in their second exile. But this time it's different. This time the folks in Judah are exiled together. And so it's kind of like they set up a temporary camp and they're still able to uphold all of their rituals. And they have their community. And they retain their faith. And so in this exile, there's still hope. They have totally experienced the broken world. The fact that we're all scattered and we don't start on the same plane. And these guys are just screaming, can we please get a break? This is not fair. <laughs> right? Like a kindergarten. This is not fair. But there's hope. That's what chapter 61 is about. Chapter 61 talks about the prophet who comes and speaks the name, the words of the Lord. It says, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. There's hope. But I really love this chapter, especially as we talk about justice and our actions. Because it gets flipped on its head halfway through. Are you ready? I know I'm losing you. Are you ready? Are you ready? I promise. It's good. Okay. All right. So it starts out and it looks like it's all on the prophet, right? Like the prophet's going to come in and bring the scales back into order. That the prophet will be the one to do the action, right? No. So in verse 3b, it changes. and it, 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 Up until then, it's all the prophet is going to preach the good news and comfort those who mourn and give them beauty instead of ashes, okay? Then it flips and it starts saying, but they will be called oaks of righteousness. And they, the ones who are broken and lost and poor, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and they will renew the ruined cities. They will be restored. It's not that, that we're going to do justice and we're going to come in and write the scales. It's that God comes in and writes the scales by giving, giving those who found themselves way up here a way to keep moving but maybe we just have to keep moving by turning around and walking alongside. Right? This is the idea of solidarity. Right? And we don't do justice because we know the correct way or we know what's better. We do justice because we know that it's easier to do when you're not alone. That's God's call to justice. That God knows the world is broken and that all is not right. But that we are called to bring it back into line through God's justifying grace. That's the second kind of grace. Tom talked about the first one, Caribbean. Justifying grace. God brings us back into line with who we're supposed to be. So if you had to fill in the, the board, ah, uh, I remember. If you had to fill in the board, in this church, we, what would you say about the body of Christ? Oh, we care. What else? In this church, we Welcoming without judgment. We welcome without judgment. We're one. We are one. Sing. In this church we? Sing. Sing? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said sin. That was good, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we sing, yes. We yeah. sing. We celebrate. Support one another. Support one another. That's wonderful. Share. We share. At the risk of putting, pushing it too far, I have another story for you. So this morning, as I'm getting ready for the sermon, and this happens every Sunday morning without fail, 
my son gets up super early and he comes in and he needs my attention. Darn it, I cannot wake up earlier than that kid. I try. So he comes in this morning and he runs and he says, Mommy, Mommy, I want you to make me breakfast and I want you to come and see my toy. You know, like how it would go, right? I say the same thing I say every Sunday morning. I say, Graham, Mommy cannot come and make you breakfast right now because I have to finish my work. And what do I tell him every Sunday? I say, I'm working on the sermon, right? So he's very familiar with this word. So this morning he says to me, he, he's just joking. He's just trying to get my attention. He says, Mommy, are you a sermon? <laughs> I said, what? And my automatic answer was, no, of course I'm not a sermon. But now he knows he's got me. So he asked me several more times, Mommy, are you a sermon? Mommy, I think you are a sermon. And it hit me. I realized that's exactly what we're talking about. When we embody justice, we are a sermon. You are a sermon. Your life is a sermon. We'll continue our time of worship through the giving of tithes and offerings.